I think that should be everybody in for the session. So as I think many of the participants probably will know, um, you are already on mute, on mute, but your videos are on show. If for any reason you want to turn your video off, feel free. That's just sort of how I've set it up upon you entering. What the session is going to entail is each of the panelists will introduce themselves, explain a little bit about how they got into um, the, their area of practice, a little bit about their background, and then the second part of the session will be a, a Q&A. For the sort of purposes of this session, if you can all just keep your microphones on mute because there are almost a hundred of you, and if you just try, type your questions in the chat box at the bottom, then the panelists will um, answer your questions a little bit later on. Is that all right? So I'm happy for you um, to all start whenever. I mean, Carl's the, and Lawrence are off of mute, so if either of you want to start, feel free. Oh, Lawrence, you can go first. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, first of all, this is a very surreal experience. I've not used this before during lockdown because we were, as barristers, we were tasked as key workers. So in fact, I've been going into chambers. I've been conducting my hearings normally, albeit by telephone, and going into the court office, which is manned by court staff at the RCJ. So nothing has changed a great deal, to be honest. Um, now, uh, why did I become a barrister? Uh, the truth, the real truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, I fell out with my bank manager. Um, he argued that I shouldn't have any more funding and explained what was I going to do with my law degree. I didn't really know. Um, and I felt that I wanted to have flexibility. He wanted me to stop studying my PhD. And we reached a trade-off whereby I went to bar school. Uh, and in those days, there was just the Inns of Court bar school, which is reopening, as you know, in a new format this year. Um, so it had a monopoly. It restricted the numbers that could come into the bar. And that was the first year they had psychometric testing. Um, and the humor with that is it, every candidate had to take the tests and only those who passed would be allowed to do the course. Um, but many people who'd already got pupillages and scholarships failed the test. And in fact, there was an uproar. Uh, the inns were in uproar, uh, threatening the school. Uh, legal actions were threatened. And in the end, they reversed the rule. A few years later, Professor Nigel Savage, who I know quite well, argued very strongly that the monopoly should be broken. It was. And now we have in excess of 2,000 people studying for pupillage. Um, so I became a barrister. Um, what I didn't realize that within um, seven years of practice, I'd become a head of chambers. It was uh, a, an accident. It, it was naive. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, I've learned a great deal about running chambers and, and running a business rather than just putting on my wig and making my submissions. Um, so my original background though was science and technology and computing. I still try and bring that into my everyday practice. Um, the world was always going to move that way as this uh, particular meeting shows. Um, and it has allowed me to retain the interest that I had as a student with electronics and computing, just dealing with them through legal means. Aviation is in my background too, and it's in my practice. Um, I'm counsel in the RAFA Shore and Air Disaster for the RAF Association, um, and that's a matter which is on the commercial and insurance side. I also deal with banking and finance, um, but I find that a great deal of my time in my role is to look at where we're steering at chambers, where we're steering the profession, so that the bar can continue to expand. It has its place. Um, most countries, as you know, have few systems. Um, we're quite unique, along with Hong Kong um, and a few other places. But for me, it's imperative that we keep encouraging people to come to the bar and to understand it's accessible, to understand it rewards those who are brave. But that's the truth in life. Um, you have to take risk to get reward. That's the equation that every business will tell you. You have to invest and those are your studies and your time. And there will always be a risk, there'll never be certainty. Um, but what I don't like is when the institutions try and shut down people's dreams of coming to the bar 
Um, I don't like when the academic institutions do that. And I work closely with Middle Temple and Inner Temple, um, meeting with university professors and deans, etc., and encouraging them not to create artificial bottlenecks for students. They are not the people in my very respectful opinion to them, um, and I'm not saying anything out of turn, um, that should dictate to students their limits. Students should find out for themselves. And yes, I understand it costs money and it's regrettable these universities charge so much for a course that does very little, in my opinion, as an employer. But what they shouldn't do is uh, extinguish the dreams of candidates. If you want to reach for the stars, reach for them. It's your life, it's your choice. Be inspired, inspire yourself, be determined, know it's hard work. But what's at the other end? A career which in my view is immensely rewarding. You have one life, um, you want to have a job that gives you as much joy, uh, even though I hear myself say that out loud, I do mean that. And um, you will get reward because you're self-employed, you work hard, um, you use your skills, and you get to choose what you want to do. Um, it's a very, very enjoyable position to be in. And there's no reason for the bar to be in contraction. There should be more pupillages, in my opinion. Um, we should have more accessibility. And I'm sure they, the others will talk about that as well and I can answer any questions. Um, but what we mustn't do is create the bottlenecks at, at schools and universities. People should feel free and comfortable and take their chances. It's the same with any job on the whole. You've got to take a risk. But don't be disheartened. Um, know that there are people like me on the other side willing to pull you up. We want you here. We want the profession to expand. The final point I just want to mention is in the current climate, um, I'm involved as a head of chambers with working with the Bar Council um, and the government um, in giving uh, feedback and information on the operational side of legal services delivered by the Bar. Of course, it's a tough time because if your trials are adjourned because we can't have witnesses, although the old Bailey was back today, um, the position is you don't have cash flow. But we'll work around that, sure. Um, it becomes even more imperative that for the profession to continue to grow and develop, that we look to assisting candidates who want to come through and join. Um, we're going to take a hit economically of course it's common sense if you're a barrister and you don't go to court to do a trial you don't get paid there's a cash flow issue um, it's my job to look at how we uh, deliver cash flow and how we deliver for further legal services with more digital operation we'll do that but at the same time we can't use this current virus uh, the current economic situation to actually um, pull up the shutters, we'll pull up the drawbridge, close the shutters. And I fear that might be something. So keep an eye out for that. Um, pupillages, people with pupillages, as we've got two in the pipeline, we've reached out to them immediately saying, your positions are guaranteed. Um, we're going nowhere, don't worry. Um, so the final thought from me is uh, difficult times, but it shouldn't change uh, anyone's heart uh, they, if you really want to come to this profession, which is a terrific profession, an important profession, um, don't give up, dig out the resources, work hard and do things like this to encourage you and give you the additional tools you need to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. That's great. Carl, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I think I'd echo what Lawrence said in closing, really, in the general tenor. Um, of what he said throughout. Um, don't let other people tell you what you can and can't do. You decide what you can and can't do. Not a university, not the BPTC providers, etc. Um, and it's quite apt that this is non-traditional routes to the bar because I'm somewhat non-traditional myself. Um, I didn't. I went to local comprehensive school. Um, I'm about as working class as they come. Uh, as is as are my parents. I went to a non-Russell group, non red brick university um, and got my degree from there. I went to when it was the BVC, um, a little bit longer ago than I care to remember, uh, studied in Manchester, didn't get pupillage 
I then applied and secured a position as a paralegal and trainee police station representative at a firm of solicitors where I worked for 12 years. After two years, I cross-qualified as a solicitor. There was a very convenient little loophole in the regulations, which has unfortunately been shut now. But if you had completed the BBC and qualified at the bar without pupillage, you didn't need to do a training contract. All you needed to do was sit the qualified lawyer's transfer test, demonstrate two years relevant legal experience, and they let you practice as a solicitor, which was thoroughly decent of them. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I practiced criminal defense for over a decade, also specialized in prison law and life sentence prisoners, made partner. And then six years ago, I decided I was going to leave partnership and a secure and steady salary transfer back to the bar, set up my own chambers with my closest and dearest friend, and wade into the great unknown and try and make a big difference in the world. And that's effectively what we do now. Um, we're incredibly niche, we're very small. We specialize in international criminal law, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, that sort of thing. So we're heavily involved in the likes of Syria, and countries coming out either transitioning out of conflict or who have been out of conflict for some time. So again, a lot of ICC work, heavily involved with the Special Tribunal for Kosovo, African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Inter-American Commission um, on Human Rights, uh, European Court of Human Rights. So yeah, we're, we're, we're a little bit everywhere at the moment. And there's not many countries that we're not involved in. I'm also permanently banned from five of them. I can't travel to the Middle East at all apart from Qatar. Every other country in the Middle East will arrest me on site. They really, really dislike me, especially Egypt. Egypt's got a big issue. Um, we represent the family of President Morsi. We did represent President Morsi himself before he died. Um, but the point is, um, as I say, I'm not from a traditional background that would ordinarily go into the bar. The vast majority of my academic life and a significant proportion of my professional life, I was constantly told that people like you don't go to the bar. People like you don't go into law um, because of my background and because of what I did beforehand. And it was my stubbornness that got me through. Um, because I generally refuse to accept what anybody tells me. And this is a, a trait that the majority of lawyers have, um, particularly barristers, um, who have an innate confidence in their own ability and their, and their own case before the courts. And this is my own self-drive and determination that got me through. And I think that's what I would try and impart on all of you this evening. As I said at the outset, and as Lawrence has said, the only person that can put limits on your potential and where you can go is you. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't have it easy. You're not going to have it easy. Um, it's going to be even more difficult if you didn't go to Red Brick Russell Group University. It shouldn't be, and I don't agree with it, but the fact is, unfortunately, it is. It is slanted towards those universities. So you have to make yourself stand out. You have to have something else on your CV that is going to make uh, chambers, that's going to make law firms, whoever your eventual employer is, that's going to jump out at them, that's going to make them want to say, wow, I need to speak to this person because I need to find out more about this. So just because you haven't necessarily got the academics that some have, don't let that put you off. If you want to go for it, go for it. Don't get me wrong, you're all going to have to work harder than you have ever thought possible. And I still do now, 20 years into my career, uh, as I'm sure all of the panelists will tell you at whatever stage that they are at. This is not a job, this is a way of life. But if you're prepared to commit to it and you have that drive to achieve it, then you can achieve it. As I say, the only person who can put restrictions on you is you. Nobody else. Push hard enough, you will get the opportunities. And I think at that, I'll pass over and wait for questions. That's great. Thanks, Carl. Toran, did you want to go next? Sure. Thanks, Paige. And thank you, Lawrence and Carl, um, with whom I wholeheartedly agree in everything they've said. And um, thank you to all of you for joining in today. 
Uh, and really, it, it's a good sign that we have so many people on this call. And it's a good sign that this, this profession is finally diversifying after a stubborn number of years uh, in the way that it was. Uh, I think it's definitely a, a huge encouragement to everyone. Um, Paige has asked us to go through our a brief background of ourselves and also to provide you with some tips about where to go and just to give you an idea I, idea, I thought I'd give you an example of the kinds of things I did before I beca became a barrister and um, I'm currently a, a, a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers I practice in medical law and human rights um, which some might say is a fairly strange combination but do piecing quite well together and um, I've only been a barrister for about a year and a half now. So I finished, um, finished pupillage last year and then did a third six and was taken on as a tenant. Um, uh, my background is, is relatively unconventional. I'm a, from a second generation immigrant family, working class background. Um, I actually started school not speaking English. I used to speak only Turkish at home. So my, my first day of primary school, my mum gave them some key words like water and toilet so that I all of my needs were met um, and then I, I, I off I went to primary school with absolutely no language skills and um, I have a fairly unconventional background in terms of education as well I didn't go to private school though I, di I did get into grammar school um, because my primary school teacher stuck me in for the test um, I then went to Red Brick Uni, I went to Bristol, and I then did a master's at the LSE in public law, specialising um, in the area in which I eventually wanted to practice. I spent the time at university, or at least the summers of university, gaining experience doing things like mini pupillages, marshalling, vacation schemes, which I thought were great because they paid really well. And at the same time, you could um, you could say, here's, you know, here's the experience I got working at a solicitor's firm and here's exactly why I don't want to do that for the rest of my life and actually want to become a barrister instead. Um, and I also did some placements with NGOs uh, trying to get some experience. Um, during my master's degree, I then applied for pupillage. I didn't get it the first time round. I was a reserve. Um, I didn't expect to get it the first time round. And the reality is actually very few people do these days. A lot of people will have gone through two or three rounds of application before they're successful. Um, but don't let that put you off because it is an incredibly difficult profession to get into. Um, I didn't let it put me off. I, um, I ended up applying for various other things and ended up doing a traineeship at the European Court of Justice, which it turns out was a great investment of my time because it was the one thing that came up, came up in every single interview the following year. Um, in addition to that, I did various internships and um, I was very lucky in doing those because a lot of them were unpaid. And um, the only reason I was able to do them is because I, live at, I lived at home in London with my parents, didn't cost me anything because they covered travel. Um, and it is an unfortunate disadvantage to those who don't live in London and can't, um, you know, aren't remunerated for their travel and can't afford it. So immediately there are disadvantages um, which you will face from day one and it's up to you to remedy those. So, I mean, one of the things I did, for example, is paralegaling in the summer a high street firm no big name um very very you know very small firm very niche firm um and i saved up in my, enough money to buy myself a macbook which i then used when i went into practice um so there are things outside of unpaid traineeships and things like that um that, that will allow you to gain some experience um coming to the end of, of my story i then did a, a pupillage at a specialist medical law set um, I eventually moved over as a third six to where I am now at Doughty Street um, and nowadays I practice in clinical negligence, personal injury, court of protection, um, inquest and police law, um, which is a very interesting and, and varied mix. Um, to give you an idea of any of those practice areas, just in case any of you want, do want to go into them, because I think they are a great variety. Um, what I would expect to be doing on a daily basis in my Clinic and PI work is um, expert conferences, advising on merits and quantum in claims, um, drafting schedules of loss. In reality, we go to trial very infrequently in those areas. And if court work is the kind of work that you're aiming for, um, then those two areas, potentially with the exception of PI, which is a bit more court based. Um, but generally speaking, those two areas are far less court based compared to things like crime and family, for example. Um, by contrast, my court of protection work, which is very niche, it's all to do with mentally incapacitated people or on whose behalf we act to 
um, to protect their interests um, is very court heavy, um, but it's a very different approach. It's non-adversarial, it's collaborative, um, and everyone's pursuing some, you know, the best interests of the person in question. Again, in inquests are also slightly different in that they are um, fact-finding exercises, so they're a bit like inquiries, and I I'm sure Phil will be able to tell you about that because he sits as a coroner, I know, um, in addition to practicing. Um, and it is the one thing I will say about inquest is that it's an amazing way to get advocacy exposure at the very junior end. Uh, I've gone into inquests and dealt with five or six witnesses on, on a single day, and you will um, only infrequently see that in any other kind of case, potentially in an employment tribunal, but not really elsewhere, unless you're dealing with criminal matters. So in the civil jurisdiction, if you want to get some advocacy exposure, inquest work is actually quite a, a good thing to deal with um, at the junior end. Uh, and my final area is police law. Um, uh, primarily I deal with actions against the police uh, in matters like wrongful arrest, breaches of the Human Rights Act, um, malicious prosecution, and it's a very paper heavy part of my practice. On to the advantages and disadvantages of this job. Um, there are many on both sides. Advantages, intellectual rigour is the first. You, you'll be dealing with le very challenging legal and practical issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And frankly, there isn't a single day in this job where I don't have to look something up. But I love that because I, I want to be in a job where I can learn. Uh, the second thing is the adrenaline rush. Um, I know it's cliche, but it is a real thing. There is honestly nothing like the feeling of getting a gem of evidence from someone in, in witness examination or from having a judge accept your submissions in a judgment, um, you know, submissions that you've worked so hard on. It gives you such an immense um, satisfaction, job satisfaction, when you've worked so hard for your client to have that. The third thing is lear learning from others. In this profession, Again, it's cliche, but you genuinely will be, you know, you'll be surrounded by people with brains the size of a planet. It's amazing how much you learn from your colleagues on a day to day basis. And it's a very collegiate profession where people are very open to sharing tips and experiences. And the final thing is flexibility. And the others have already touched on this. This is probably the biggest um, advantage to this job. You are your own boss. Um, you know, I have had, for example, when I finished my third six, I called up my clerks and I've said, look, I'm knackered. I need a holiday. I'm taking five weeks off to go and travel around Southeast Asia with the money that I've earned during third six. Um, I'll see you later. Please book out five weeks. There is no other job in which I could have done that without being booted out. And I think it honestly is. Um, it, it, it's one of those immense um, advantages that we have in the profession. On to the downsides. Um, well, as the others have already said, this is, this is a hard job. Um, let there be no uh, misunderstandings about that. There are long hours, there are difficult clients, and there are days where you'll say to myself, yourself when you're stuck on a five hour train to Yeovil in the middle of nowhere, what on earth am I doing with my time? Um, it's improved somewhat during COVID because actually I don't go to court at all anymore. I do my hearings on the phone. Um, but it is something which I expect will resume at some point and which you'll have to be prepared to consider. Um, to give you an example, yesterday I awoke to the wonderful sight of uh, an email from my solicitor at 8.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning asking for work that I hadn't had time to do because I was so busy doing the other work. I then worked until one o'clock in the morning last night, got up at seven today to draft the position statement for a case in the afternoon, but then didn't go ahead. Um, not every day is like that. You, you, you have days where you're nine to five. There are days where you can take the day off in the middle of the week because you feel like it because you have that flexibility. But it is a profession where you have to work hard. So um, be prepared and, and you have to work hard in getting there in the first place. What can you then do to enhance your prospects of succeeding in getting there? Well, um, the first piece of advice I'll give is to get some experience. It's very rare these days that you'll click on the profile of a very junior baby barrister and see that they've gone straight into, at, into the bar from uni. Um, actually, it's more, far more frequent to see people who have gained maybe one, two, three years of experience um, before coming to the bar. And that really is something that helps to sell those people to clients because you're not just a lawyer, you're somebody who is providing very practical guidance, which is necessarily informed by your own life experiences. As I said, I, I saw um, the year after I applied, once I'd done 
various different things between my masters and pupillage um, I, I saw a doubling in the number of interviews that I got precisely because I'd gone away and got so much experience in the meantime I, I think don't be don't be rushed give yourself a year or two to grow as a person when you make your applications the second piece of advice um, it is, and I'm sure many of you are doing this already, but it's to apply for scholarships from the inns for your bar course, because that is the first rubber stamp on saying, you know what, this is someone that we think can make it in the profession. And actually, I find that the interview experience for getting those scholarships, it is good experience for first round interviews with pupillage. And um, simply be a being able to say, um, you know, I've already been approved by a panel is a good thing to be able to do. Um, obviously not to mention the fact that the bar course is extortionately priced. Frankly, I wouldn't have been able to afford it if I hadn't had a full scholarship. So um, I've just had a question saying if applicants don't have a scholarship, is this a bar to pupillage? Absolutely not. I'm simply saying apply for them while they're there. They're a good source of funding. They are, it's good if you can get them, but they are by no means a be all and end all. And I certainly know many people who didn't get them at all or who applied a second time round before they got them. Um, Advice to those who do not have scholarships is another question I've had. Um, well, I, I think you build your profile elsewhere. You build your profile through having a, a corking application form, um, building experience around the area that you want to go into and in really preparing hard for those interviews. And on that point, um, I'll give some, some advice specific to applications. Um, the, the thing I did actually when I started my applications that hugely helped me was make a plan of what I was going to include in each section of these 150 word um, application questions so that I didn't end up repeating myself. Don't forget, this application is not just there for content, you're selling yourself. It's a way of showing your advocacy. So in addition to assessing the content of your application, readers of that application will be looking at the way it's written. So plan it out really well, spend the time, invest in doing that before you begin writing. The second thing is to treat that application like a load of submissions in a case. Think of it as your argument. Why do I want to be a barrister? Give yourself three points. First, this is why. Second, this is what's inspired me to do it. Third, here's why I'm going to be great at it. Break it down into points, make it clear cut and make it persuasive. The third thing is to start drafting early. Um, I gave myself about, uh, about a week probably you need more time than that but I, I started my applications about a week before I submitted them it took me the full week to perfect them I'd actually advise starting them far earlier start them a month beforehand go back to them mull, mull things over and um, give yourself a bit of time to to you know to engage with what you've written um, and the final thing for applications is not to be scared to include interesting things there'll be people you know that there'll be many amongst you who do so many wonderful things outside of the law who've had so many wonderful life experiences who might have had to hold down hold, hold down part-time jobs whilst you know studying don't be scared to include those things because they show that you're different they show that you're able to multitask and they just make you a bit more interesting to the panel for interviews um i have a few other pieces of advice First, um, when you apply actually, uh, probably related to applications rather than interviews, um, make sure you speak to people and do mini pupillages. If you've got a, me you, you can apply through the inns for mentors, regardless of, um, you know, whether you know anyone. I didn't know anyone in the profession. Uh, I had absolutely no idea, but I, I got in touch with the inns. Um, the Inner Temple has a great mentoring scheme. I, I think the others do as well. And um, find yourself someone who can actually tell you about the practice areas the chambers do because a lot of them advertise for things but actually you find out that they, they're far more focused on other things that, than they suggest. Um, the second thing is to prepare and I know it sounds obvious but these these interviews are really quite labour intensive um, I found that going through questions and talking to myself in the mirror as stupid as it sounds really helped with my confidence when I came to do the interviews and um, I also used to write down the questions that I was asked when I came out of each interview because a lot of them are recycled. You, you'll go into another interview and it will be the same question and you'll have prepared it in advance because you knew it was coming. And that shows that you, you come across as confident and you're able to um, deal with things on the spot. Overall, um, I think the message I'm sending is it's a hard profession, it's a rewarding profession 
and um, you should absolutely go for it if you if you want to do it. Um, don't be scared if you don't succeed the first time. Many of us didn't. I certainly didn't. Um, get the experience and use it to your advantage the next time around. Um, I think that's all from me. I've waffled on for far too long, but I hope that will provide you with some interesting tips um, to work into your applications. Thank you so much for that, Turan. Syed, would you like to go next? I may be sure. on. Great. I think that's what happens when you're uh, when you go to the end of the line and everyone else has covered all the nicer, juicier bits. Thank you so much for the pan uh, to the panelists for covering those areas. I will try not to repeat or replicate uh, what they've said, all of which I wholeheartedly support. I'll start by explaining a bit about my background before I came to the bar. My, uh, I went to a comprehensive, didn't go to a private school. My undergraduate degree was actually in theology. Um, so yes, it's possible um, to have a complete change in subject area and uh, the line of work you want to do. I started the GDL in 2006, 2007 and started the full-time bar course in 2008. Now, um, some of the similarities we can draw between 2008, the financial crisis, and now. Um, as Lauren said, there may be pupillages which get withdrawn the next year or two. Timbers might be reluctant to uh, allocate their resources in bringing on new talent when work is um, looking dry or when members of Chambers are trying to recoup some of their uh, losses in income by taking on more cases. What happened in 2008 is I was working uh, full-time and started the bar course full-time. And I advise anybody thinking of doing that, absolutely don't. Um, it was practically impossible despite my best efforts. I then had to convert to the part-time course. And again, as an alternative uh, route to the bar, I think considering the different options, uh, what's possible, how you might be able to make things work for you, um, is just taking a moment to think, well, this is the standard route, um, doing a law degree, doing the bar course, and then straight on to pupillage. As uh, Turan just said, it's although that's the ideal. It's uh, unlikely when you go onto Chambers' websites to see a junior barrister who's actually been able to do that. There are occasions, but as alternatives go, they, uh, they are varied and um, you'll find lawyers who make their own mark. So don't feel hesitant about pursuing the options um, that suit you as opposed to what you think uh, is meant to be followed. Having gone on to the part-time course, I was working full-time. Um, I didn't want to take out any student loans. I was supporting my elderly parents. I didn't get a scholarship. So in answer to uh, someone who asked, is it uh, make or break? The answer is no. Um, I didn't make as much effort in um, scholarship applications, to be absolutely honest. Uh, not that I would have got it if I did. What I'm saying is there were other pressures. Um, I was working three jobs at one point, even though I did the course, the bar course part-time, I found that in the, uh, after completing the first year, it, it had been extremely difficult to both fund the course and do the course. I then decided to defer the second year. In that time, I worked. Um, I worked as hard as I could so that when I went back to doing the second year, my grades didn't suffer because ultimately my ambition was to apply for pupillage and I knew having poor grades, uh, no matter how hard I uh, worked, just wouldn't cut it. I deferred uh, knowing full well that this would also impact any pupillage application because uh, lack of commitment, um, 
do I not have the drive? Various questions uh, would arise. However, I then went on to doing the second year part-time whilst working full-time. And when it came to applying for pupillage, um, in my second year, before I finished my second year, while well, starting the second year, because people just are usually a year ahead or two years ahead, I made a number of applications, um, just a few to the sets that I had done many pupillages at. Before I finished my second year, I was offered a pupillage. By the time I finished my second year, I realized uh, at the time the minimum uh, funding for pupillages was 10,000 pounds. Um, I had been working, I still had family to support. Um, my father had passed away, my mother was even more reliant on me. Um, I couldn't take £10,000 and do a pupillage knowing exactly how much time and commitment it would take. It's not like I could do a pupillage full time and uh, a job part time to supplement my income. Um, that was when the brunt of the financial crisis was really being felt and I decided hang on a second, um, I, I still need to meet my uh, obligations, my commitments, and I had to literally look at my priorities. And um, as bad as that sounds, um, and it sounded terrible when I then went back to doing pupillage applications, explaining why didn't you apply for pupillage earlier? Um, I, I decided that no, I'm going to stay the course and um, gain other experience, which I can then go back to pupillage panel and say, um, I didn't do it then, but um, I'm applying for pupillage now and these are the reasons why you should give it to me. I was um, working over the years, how I got into banking and finance. Over the financial crisis came the retail distribution review, a complete overhaul of the financial uh, regulatory system banks were looking for consultants who could come in, um, interpret the new frameworks and try and implement some of those. I worked for a number of years with Deloitte, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, ran four years at Coots, looking at um, the various changes that had been implemented due to the financial crisis. Uh, eventually when I did uh, apply for pupillage, I didn't make many applications. In fact, I didn't go through the pupillage gateway 12 um, that you normally do. Um, I handpicked a few and um, that were interesting type of work and type of experiences that I had. And I guess um, there are two approaches. You can take the machine gun approach and apply to um, loads and loads of chambers. I remember whilst I was on the bar course, back in 2008 when I first started, there were students who were opening multiple. And now I don't advise uh, anybody go and do this, but opening multiple accounts on the, uh, it was called the pupillage portal back then, um, so that they could get more than the 12. Some were hitting 24 or whatever. But the reality is, uh, if you're making heaps and heaps of applications, chances are, you're making errors. You're not giving it uh, everything that that particular set of chambers are looking for. Errors will creep in. Uh, not only that, it's not bespoke to that set. Sets um, invest a huge amount of uh, resources into training uh, their pupils. Now, you need to convince them why they should train you. Why are they going to pay? Um, at least for the first six months, they're providing you with money from uh, fees that they've taken, commission they've taken from other barristers, and um, they want to know specifically why you've chosen them. What I would suggest is have a look at the type of chambers you want to apply for. If, for whatever reason, you're uh, unable to apply for privilege now or you're unsuccessful, then uh, gain the experiences that you think will improve your CV. It doesn't have to be um, legal, uh, strictly speaking. It doesn't have to be 
uh, an experience that barristers don't normally do. Take an experience and the challenge will be during a pupillage interview, you might have to explain, well, how do you think your skills will be useful to you as a barrister? And um, think about that when applying for the job that you apply for. What transferable skills are you going to be gaining? Um, aside from that, what everyone else has said, um, just recapping, take part in exercises like this, ask questions. There are plenty of barristers who are wanting to pull you up, pull you in. Um, it's difficult when looking into the bar from the outside thinking you're out in the cold um, and there's cozy little environment where uh, it's close knit. The bar's changing very, very rapidly. Um, come in, the doors open, ask for help, uh, take part in advocacy exercises, be it civil or criminal. Uh, all the inns run uh, mental uh, mentoring schemes. There's also the um, Commercial Bar Association and um, the mentoring scheme that is run through them and the various sets of chambers. There's, um, there's one that uh, I'm taking part in, i.e. think it's full now, but what I will do is um, pass on the contacts and the links to anybody who's interested. Um, I'll take any questions if anybody has any and uh, feel free to connect and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Syed. And last but no, by no means least, Phil, I think you're on the next page. I didn't forget about you. <laughs> oh, can you hear me now? Am yes. I on the page now? Um, you're on. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I've been having a few internet problems, so if I go off, I'll try and come back on as soon as I can. Uh, I went to Newcastle Polytechnic. There you go, I've said it and it became Northumbria University part way through my degree. I remember turning up outside the Atkin building, you could only do the bar course in London when I did it, and meeting what has now become a lifelong friend. He went to Eton College and he was wearing a cravat and plus fours and I could barely understand a word of what he was saying at the time. And me being a Northern lad, uh, was asked a question. I was asked, uh, where was the Atkin building? Ah, well, I know that. I can take you there. Um, I've just come from there myself. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself on that day, what on earth am I doing here? Everybody's going to be far more intelligent than me, and everybody's going to get on far better than I will. You've got to have faith in your own ability. You've got to be determined. And in this job, you've really got to want it. Absolutely. If you don't really want this job, and it is a way of life, and it does sound trite, but if you experience this job, you will understand why it is that it's a way of life. But if you don't really want the job, pack in now and go and do something else. Because most of you on this call will not make it. Because... As you probably know, you only need to do the arithmetic. Many, many more people are qualifying than there are spaces in chambers. Fact. Uh, what did I do to try and get in? So I had the disadvantage, and let's not beat around the bush, it's a massive disadvantage of having a, an old poly degree. Um, I didn't have any fancy degree behind me, so I started naively applying for pupillages and the problem I had was even getting through the door to get an interview right and a lot of you will experience very similar problems and it was something like 60 or 70 percent in my year I don't think it's much different now of the pupillage offers were held by 10 percent of the candidates how do you try to defeat that how do you beat that so I can tell you, I made in the first couple of years, hundreds of applications, what's been described as the machine gun approach. I spent hour upon hour doing my applications. It wasn't I was just 
firing off applications. I did everything I possibly could think of and more. I did mini pupillages, I did an internship, I worked with a high street practice. And what I did was I became a clerk with a high street solicitors firm. I was doing criminal work. I qualified as a solicitor. And uh, I, I became a duty solicitor. I became a men member of the Mental Health Review Tribunal. Uh, I did everything I possibly could. And what really got me into chambers, I think, was I got to know a lot of barristers. I was briefing a lot of people and I had a lot of work to bring with me. Um, and you, I made myself, I think in those days, I'm talking over 20 years ago now, I'm 48 years of age. I tried to make myself as commercial uh, uh, an option for chambers as I possibly could. Now I'm in Lincoln House Chambers in Manchester. Um, they're probably uh, one of the foremost uh, criminal sets outside London. They were probably say in the country. Uh, I would not get into those chambers as somebody coming from pupillage now because I've no doubt they would not interview me. So I, I got into those chambers because I have a practice and I hope a reputation. There are other ways to get into the profession that so many people are having to go through at the moment. So I also did the qualified lawyers transfer test, practiced as a solicitor for two or three years and then came into a, a different chambers in Manchester uh, and did my pupillage. I currently practice in criminal law, regulatory law and inquest law. Um, and over the years, um, I hope I've got some sort of a reputation. I've appeared now in over 30 murder cases uh, and I'm regularly instructed in um, Article 2 inquests. And as I think it's been mentioned, I, I sit in two areas as an assistant coroner and I find it hugely rewarding and a really interesting part of the job. My message to you is don't ever give up if you want it. There's always a way to get there. It took me years of applying and I had to look at a different route and a different way in. Um, and if anybody tells you that it's not a, a disadvantage to have an old polytechnic degree or what, you know, what now might be Northumberland or John Moores or Sheffield Hallam or whatever it is, if anybody tells you it's not a disadvantage, they're not being entirely straight with you. So you have to look at different ways of making yourself marketable. I've sat, I don't at the moment, but for most of my professional career, because I've got a vested interest in this and I know how hard it is and I know how I want to try and help people get into the profession from different backgrounds, I've sat on the pupillage committee and I've tried to offer opportunities to people from a cross section. Not all chambers will do that, not by a long chalk. But I just want to tell you certain things that have impressed me as being on a pupillage committee. Um, from things like the presentation of a CV, just before you get into the content that I know others have mentioned, um, look at changing your CV. And um, there are so many different ways to put it forward. We've had people putting it in different colors, different fonts, different boxes. There's different ways to have a look at it. And it just can be as something as simple as that. Look, most people that apply, I've done these days, I've done internships, umpteen mini pupillages, uh, and they've got fantastic CVs and you are competing on that sort of playing field. You have to set yourself aside. You have to make yourself noticed. And I can't impress upon people enough. A couple of years ago, we had two fantastic candidates who um, we were deciding who was the last place in for an interview um, in Chambers. Um, they're currently in Chambers. And what got that person through was that they were the national gymnastics uh, tr and trampolining champion, the British trampolining champion. And that was the difference in getting them into chambers. I'm not suggesting you go out and buy a trampoline, but there does have to be something that you need to put in extra 
to grab my attention if I'm on that pupillage committee. I want to have you being interviewed. I want to see that enthusiasm coming through the page. Um, I, I've heard some good tips already about the actual CV and the application itself. It can't be boring. If I, you don't grab my attention in your application within the first few lines, I am completely turned off and you are not going to get that interview spot. Make me smile. Make me be interested. Let other people read it. So many times you see, I have got so much out of the mooting competition. I have got some real advocacy experience and I know it will help me get into the bar. Well, already I'm turned off by that application. Already you are not getting through the front door. Make it interesting. Make me want to interview you. Um, I, I, I just want to say a few um, things about the actual profession itself. I, I do not enjoy getting up at five o'clock every single morning, Monday to Friday. And I do not enjoy working Sunday afternoons when I have to. Nor do I enjoy the 50 odd emails I get every single day. It's a slog. It's awful at times is this job. If you are not committed, you should not be doing it. It can be the dullest, most boring and depressing job on the planet. But it's also the best job ever. The adrenaline rush that you get defending somebody in a crown court on a serious charge when that jury come back and acquit your defendant is second to none. It's absolutely magnificent. The job is superb. It has its highs and it has its lows, but I wouldn't do anything else for the world. But you've got to absolutely desire it. There are all sorts of things that you can do. Uh, I love criminal law and I love defending people. Uh, I love the camaraderie in the uh, roving room. I love everything that comes through it. I love being self-employed. I love the variety. Uh, I love the passion. Um, we're all doing this and you should be doing it for the right reasons. Um, because if you get into the profession, particularly if you're doing the sort of areas of work that I do, you will make a reasonable living if you are a decent barrister, if you have a practice but you will not be ever well off unless you go to the commercial bar. And even then, you are not going to uh, uh, be uh, shrouded in riches. Um, do it for the right reasons. I, I make a reasonable living, a, a decent living by most people's standards. Um, but you must do it because you want to do it and you make a difference. I, I'm going to sound trite here. You are entrusted to represent the interests of other people. And if you just stand back for a minute and think about what that actually means, you have the power to shape somebody's life in a court. You have the power to persuade people to assist the person that you are representing. Then it follows that you should be the very, very cream of the crop in our country. And you must have some sort of desire and to make a difference in people's lives. Um, representing somebody on sentence, for instance, the single mother that's made the mistake or the young lad who's got a family that's hit somebody in a nightclub, not particularly exciting cases, but if you keep them out of custody, you get that suspended sentence, possibly against the odds, then you've made something of a difference. If you've gone that extra yard, you've advised that we get that extra piece of evidence, that extra psychiatric report, the extra, go that extra mile. And what I am looking for on a pupillage committee is not necessarily in common law terms, somebody who is the most academic individual. I want somebody who's prepared to go down the cells and speak with the heroin addict who's got the mental health problems, speak with the defendant who's got learning difficulties and be able to communicate properly with them, have their attention, 
take the instructions from people and it may take you hours on that particular case and the pay may be absolutely awful but because that person needs your help and you're the only person to assist them how do you communicate that um, to a potential employer to a potential chambers do the mini pupillages by all means because most people will have those on the cv the thing about mini pupillages is you can find uh, people who you um, make a contact with and we have in chambers put people forward who really impressed us on mini pupillages uh, to the interview uh, itself so that can assist do all those things and make yourself rounded um, make your cv stand out be interesting um, and be passionate about what you want to do is, is, is what i would advise uh, and never please give up if it's what you wanted it took me years uh, but i find it the most rewarding job i, I love being a barrister and i also love um, sitting as a coroner if i can make a difference if i can find the extra piece of information that assists a family in getting those answers as to how their loved one came by their death. It's, it is such a rewarding area of the law. Um, so I think that's all I propose to say at this stage. Don't give up. Thanks, Phil. I sp think I speak on behalf of everybody that that whole panel um, of insight was actually great. So thanks so much for that. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, go through the questions. Some of them are aimed at specific practitioners and others are more general. If you feel that you have an answer for the more general ones, then just feel free to unmute yourself and answer the questions as we go. So the first one is for you, Carl, and it says, how did you start in international criminal law? Um, with one client and £3,000 in the bank. Um, effectively, <laughs> uh, which, as I put on the chat, with um, with hand with hindsight, was the most ridiculous risk I think that anybody would ever take. Fortunately, it paid off. Um, so, uh, to cut a very long story short. Um, my head of chambers is also my closest friend, and we set up Guernica together, um, and it is what it is now. So. Um, me and Toby did our degrees together um, and as Phil was saying he went to a polytechnic I went to University College Northampton. University College Northampton couldn't even issue its own degrees when I did mine we all got a Leicester degree which made us look brilliant apart from the fact we didn't go to Leicester. Um, so, <laughs> so we did our degrees together and we qualified together we both went to the bar. Um, he went to Bosnia because he went and married a Bosnian girl so they went over to Bosnia at the end of the war so he could meet um, his mother and father, uh, his mother and father-in-law. He was sat in a bar one night talking to somebody from the European police mission out there who said um, oh well we need lawyers and we're setting up a new war crimes charge chamber which was a, um, sort of complementary to the ICTY. So he did that and he worked there for a few years and then he came back into the country and he got pupillage at Nine Bertha Grove. And we, we worked on and off on little bits of domestic stuff here and there over the years and he was going on and on and on at me to, get, to do something with him. Um, and the older I got and I got to 35 and I thought if I don't go now I'm never going to go. Um, the closer I get to 40, the, the less inclined I'm going to be to make a life-changing decision. So as I say, um, I threw caution to the wind and we both jumped um, with one client and we worked harder and faster than anybody else. And that's how we set ourselves apart and that's how we built the practice to what it is now. Um, to give you, and um, I said earlier that you'll work harder than you will ever work in your life. And Phil mentioned the same, the sleepless nights, the working all weekends. To give you one example, last year I got leave from the pretrial chamber at the International Criminal Court to submit amicus observations on the question of jurisdiction for the Rohingya um, coming out of Myanmar into Bangladesh. They granted me leave on the Thursday. They wanted the submission by lunchtime on the Monday. Um, so I had three and a half days to draft a 35,000 word submission and I pretty much didn't sleep for three days 
And that's, and that's what I mean by you will work harder than you thought possible. I have a wife, I have a little girl who's now 11. Um, she was 10 at the time. I literally had to ignore them for four days. Um, so I could sit there and get it done. And that's a hard thing to do, was, is to turn around to your family and say, look, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to see you because this has to get done. And that's what you have to be prepared to do. Um, you have to make an incredible sacrifice. But again, as Phil has said, as everybody has said, it is just the best job in the world. There, 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 is, nothing, there is nothing like it both from your own self-satisfaction of the job well done, the fact that you are so self-driven in developing your practice, and whatever area of law that you are in, no one area is more important than another because it's all relative. When you get that decision that goes in your favour, be it a judgment, be you find a piece of evidence uh, when you win a case, doesn't matter what it is, when you get that decision, the adrenaline rush that you get is like nothing else on earth. Great. The next question is from Emma, who says, as a mature student, would my pre-university work experience, which is not related to law, make a difference to my pupillage applications? Can I come in on that? Uh, absolutely not. It's definitely something you should be drawing on. Um, I mean, I, I, I think... I did something quite traditional in that the work I did alongside my studies was part-time tuition. So I, I, throughout the whole of my academic studies, I used to tutor law, French, various other subjects part-time to fund myself through my studies. Um, and it was one of the things I always used to put in my applications to say, actually, what's teaching? Well, it's boiling down to the very basics and explaining it to someone in a way that is um, best comprehensible by them absolutely draw on the skills that you've gained because um, I think the first thing that a panelist will ask you about is your non-law experiences because they want somebody who's interesting and um, to give you another example I mean a number of panelists have mentioned you know uh, don't be scared to put things you do in your spare time and so on I remember one of my um, I remember one of my second round pupillage for the chambers at which I did my pupillage I um, was asked about your yoga because I'd mentioned it in my um, application and they were like oh so you've mentioned hatha yoga what's hatha yoga and you know how does that help you in becoming a barrister um, apart from the awkwardness of having to explain this to a panel of three middle class men actually it was a great way of saying um, you know trying not to look at them well actually this is what it is um, it, it's allowed me to build up stamina in x y and z this is a hard job I'm going to need a way to relax yoga is the perfect way to do that and if you're interested, I'll send you the link to the website I use. You know, make it, make it interesting. As everybody said, um, you've got so many of these people who have just done back-to-back -back mooting competitions and back-to-back -back pupillages, and actually it becomes very tedious for people. So emphasise and capitalise on those opportunities, I'd say. Great. The next question is from Anish. It says, Lawrence and Carl, what advice would you give to a foreign qualified advocate looking for pupillage? Do you want to take this one, Lawrence? Let me try and unmute you. Here we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, to make an application in the normal way, I'm sure Carl would agree. Um, we both do international work uh, in our chambers. Um, we're always looking for uh, the qualities and international uh, qualified lawyer can bring to the team. Uh, that's very important, particularly in larger pieces of work. Um, so what they need to do is go through the process as per normal um, and make the application and in that draw upon their experience from their own jurisdiction. Over to you, Carl. Um, I think that I'd echo that. Uh, Guernica is incredibly diverse, um, helped by the fact that we have chambers in London um, we have an office in San Francisco and we have one in Madrid. Um, so we have lawyers from various countries across the world. In the UK, as far as Chambers is concerned, um, we have one barrister who did the majority of his studies in Bangladesh and then qualified in the UK. Um, and our pupil from last year is Syrian. Um, Ibrahim came over into the UK probably about seven years ago and did his law degree and his master's in the UK and then went to the bar from there. 
Uh, we currently have an intern with us who originates from Libya. Um, so yeah, I, what I would say to you is whatever you have, use it to your advantage. So if your experience as a foreign qualified lawyer, if you think that sets you apart for whatever reason that it is and makes you a better candidate, then you sell it. You work with whatever you have and whatever you can turn into a positive to make your CV stand out. And as Phil has said, make it look interesting and make other people want to speak to you, then you sell it. Um, your CV, as us as employers and us as recruiters, we need to see a CV that's going to smack us around the face, basically. And so there is no other option but to get this person in. And it doesn't matter what that reason is that we want to get you in, or whatever it is on your CV, but you've got to give us a reason to say, have to interview that person, have to speak to them and find out more. So if it is the fact that you're an international qualified lawyer, well, tell me why then. Tell, tell me why I need to interview that because that is a positive as far as you're concerned. What does it mean do you bring to the table? Either a language um, because of the way that my chambers, um, the areas that we practice in, and, you know, the language may assist or, or your contacts in that country may assist or previous work that you've done in a particular country that we're already involved in may assist. For instance, Ibrahim, as far as Syria is concerned, he gives us access to a huge amount of groups on the ground in Syria that helps us with the accountability efforts that we're undertaking. Without him, as a 41-year-old white Englishman, it's going to be pretty much impossible for me to get that contact on the ground in Syria. So, yeah, sell it and turn it into the positive. The um, next question relates to people that are doing conversion courses and um, because they're only studying core subjects, they will not be able to gain an insight into areas such as family law, civil law, planning and environment. What sort of advice would you give in gaining insight in these areas? Syed, do you want to take that one? Yep. What I would say is if you have a particular passion for an area of law, uh, there should be more to demonstrate that than just a module on the course anyway. Um, even if you had done a full-time LLB and done the family law module uh, and you're coming for an, a pupillage interview in Chambers, we'd expect to see more than your commitment being shown by your attendance at, the, uh, at that module, at the seminars, at the lectures and maybe getting remarkable marks on the exam, you'd need to show that maybe you've done um, a summer's worth of work experience within a family law uh, solicitor's firm or shadowing a, uh, a barrister doing some paid work in family, marshalling, various other ways in which you would have gained experience of life at the bar in family. Um, as opposed to just the course. I don't think that in itself uh, will hold you back. All I'd advise is go get some more experience and I'm sure the other panelists will um, have things to say on that too. It is entirely up to you. If anybody has anything they want to add on that, if not, I will move on because I'm very conscious of time, that's all. And there's lots of questions. Yep, great. Turin, the next question is for you. How do you think your LLM built you as a person and as a future barrister? Um, okay, there are a few answers to that. Um, the reason I chose to do the LLM was because at the time I was very interested in public law and I looked at all of the public law chambers websites and saw that a lot of the juniors did have a master's um, because it's quite an academic area where even the submissions that you make are very much case law driven. So, you know, it does actually help to have that behind you. Um, but I think it's very much practice area dependent. Um, You'll see a lot of barristers who do have master's degrees in their areas of specialism, for example, in commercial law, um, in human rights law. Um, you know, th there are certain areas where it's far more common than in other areas, but it's by no means a requirement. 
as to how it helped me, um, well, first of all, the substance actually, the substance of the degree did help me later on. So for example, nowadays I do a lot of work which concerns articles five and eight of the European Convention on Human Rights, specifically, um, you know, deprivations of liberty, whether in a care home context or in the context of a police claim. And um, having learned about it, it definitely gave me a good foundation. Um, in terms of the skills, um, I don't think it's that different to what you do in an undergrad, to be honest. It's just an advanced course. Um, don't do it just because you want to be a barrister. Do it because you're actually interested in the subject matter because they're, you know, it's very expensive. And I was very lucky because I got a scholarship to do mine. Otherwise, again, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. Um, but, you know, it, it, it very much depends on the area and on, the, on what you're using it for. And I don't think it's, you know, a necessary requirement for anybody. The next question is, do you have any tips for scholarship interviews? I don't know if any of you got a scholarship from your inn or provider. I can probably um, answer that one. Um, I had a pretty hefty scholarship from the Inner Temple. Um, I was very lucky in that respect because, as I said, I didn't know anyone at the bar. I didn't really have any contacts or anybody to guide me through the process. Um, my tip is to keep it simple go through the very basic questions in advance of your interview. Things like, why do you want to go to the bar? Why don't you want to be a solicitor? What is it that makes you, you know, that makes you someone who'd be a good barrister? Write down those very basic questions and write down your answers and practice them. Obviously you have to tailor it to the question, but a lot of these questions are actually very predictable. And the interviews themselves, certainly at the Inner Temple, were no longer than about 15 or 20 minutes. And um, all you want to do is give, give that impression um, because you won't have time for more. So look prepared, um, have reasonable answers. You know, they don't have to be mind blowing answers, but as long as they're well prepared, you'll come across as someone who's cogent and able to build an argument. Great, the next question is, what are the top three qualities a future barrister should have? Did you want to take that one, Phil? No? Um, <laughs> I You've got to have academic ability. I think that's uh, a given, and pro possibly more so in some areas than others. I, I think you've got to be driven. I absolutely can't stress that enough. You've got to have desire and drive. Uh, and I think for many areas of law, personally, I think you need some empathy. You need some humanity, um, some humility. If you're dealing with victims, families, in the sort of common law area that most people will get into, you really need to have the human element to you. Um, I think there are different qualities for different areas of the law and different parts of the law. Um, but, but I think, I don't think I'd say anything else other than that really. But the, the one thing that I really want to see is desire. Great, Syed, how did you sell your experience from other roles in interview? Well, if we take it like this, the application, the paper application is the first piece of written advocacy the Chambers is seeing, and you're trying to convince them. Um, it's about drawing uh, on your advocacy skills, be persuasive, be convincing. Your interview will be the first piece of oral advocacy that the changes will see. And again, it's about drawing out um, the transferable skills that you would have gained in uh, the, skill, the experiences that you've, um, you've had. Now, as Turon said, for example, um, a vacation scheme in the summer in a solicitor's firm, you're going to pupillage, you use that to your advantage. Whatever transferable skill that there is, use it. Um, whether it's to support the argument or even if it's to say, I tried working in a solicitor's firm, um, I got the experience, I absolutely hated it, and I know I don't want to do it. Um, it's just a matter of being persuasive and being convincing. Now, most experiences that you have in whatever job, um, especially non-law-related, uh, non -law related, you want to be able to explain why you went and did that job and how it's going to help you. Think about it, um, all the experiences that you have, 
um, and explain how you can then use that. Phil just mentioned humanity, empathy, um, roles that you do, customer services, complaint handling, show that, people skills, uh, advocacy. Phil and Carl were both saying about how dealing with people um, in very difficult circumstances, going down to the cell uh, in a police station, um, going down uh, to the cell, to take instructions before the hearing, for example. Now you need to be able to demonstrate that you've got those skills. How do you do that? Use your experiences, be an advocate, advocate and um, sell that. Marketing, for example, is another one as a barrister you're self-employed. Now, uh, I, I know I haven't given very many examples from my, my own experiences, only because everyone's going to have their own and um, I didn't want to take too much time. But one of them was the service I provided to uh, high street banks and um, the big four were through a company. And as a matter of course, I had to sell my services through this company, do the marketing, do the networking uh, in order to gain repeat custom. And I was able to sell that to Chambers saying, well, I have to bring in solicitors. I have to ensure that I can build relationship. I've already done that. This is how I did it. Uh, this is demonstrated. And this is the evidence of that. So obviously about how you're going to sell. The next question is, did any of you consider the solicitor advocate route and would you recommend it? Um, I'll jump in there briefly. Uh, I was a solicitor advocate. Um, it depends on the area of law that you're looking to go into and it depends what you want out of your career. Um, from a general crime perspective, as much as you are no different as an advocate to a barrister in court, if you're a solicitor advocate, it's, it's a very different relationship and a very different way of working because you're in private practice as a, as a solicitor rather than developing your own practice. Um, so I think there's pros and cons to each, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I don't know what Phil's position would be on it. Um, I changed area of law, really. Um, I still do little bits of crime, but not a huge amount at all. Um, so the pros to it are you will still get exposed to the same work, really, as long as the firm that you are with has that work, because that's who's generating your work. Um, the cons to it you're in private practice, you're still beholden to partners, you don't necessarily get a choice as far as what work comes through and what work that you are given. Um, you may therefore not necessarily get exposed to the quality of the work that you might want to do. So as I say, it, it just depends on where you, where you see your career and where you want your career to be. Uh, as I say, I don't know whether Phil uh, uh, agrees or disagrees. Uh, yeah, um, about 10 years or so ago, uh, in the criminal courts, there was an explosion of solicitor advocates. Um, that has greatly diminished for a number of reasons. Uh, fees have gone down is one of the reasons. Uh, and I think a lot of firms don't find it financially viable any longer. So there are fewer solicitor advocates. It's great experience and it's a great way to gain the experience. And I think that's a great positive. Um, but whereas you used to see advocates going to court with six or seven PTPHs, plea hearings, um, you, you don't see that as much now. Um, I think a lot of people have gone into chambers who are solicitor advocates, so they've used that constructively as a, U, uh, as a route in. Um, my problem with it at the moment is uh, because those solicitor advocates that aren't working for the bigger firms will not be exposed to the volume of work. They still also go into the magistrate's court and the police station. And really it's all hands on deck. And so you're not necessarily getting the same sort of exposure or experience as you might do at the bar. But that said, it is a good way to get some experience. 
Next question is, how would you suggest making the most of your non-legal work experience on applications and in an interview? And how would you suggest making it clear that mini pupillages weren't an option to you financially? Lawrence, do you want to take that one? Or, yep, <laughs> I'll unmute. Right, can you hear me? Yes. Um, can you just repeat the question again? Yes, so essentially it's basically asking how do you explain on your application and in an interview that mini pupillages weren't an option because of finances? I don't think much would turn on that, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll do my best to give you a very honest answer. Um, uh, and it goes back to what I said when I made my opening statement. Um, this is a business. It's a job. It's a career. It's a business. You're self-employed. You are your own private limited company, you're the shareholder, you're the investor, you're the worker, you're the FD, you're the MD, you're the CEO, you're the COO, everything. And you need to be thinking like that when you're a student. The time you're putting in now isn't academic to me as an employer. The time you're putting in now is investment. So to turn to the question about explaining the mini pupillage, um, I wouldn't really go down that path. I would try as best as I could to get mini pupillage, to try, as you've heard um, others of us all say, um, Joanne explained about her teaching um, French, et cetera. We all did things to make money. That's why we're all on this panel. We, we weren't um, given the silver spoon. We aren't trustafarians. We grafted um, to get where we are, and we want to be here to encourage you. But part of that also involves using, you know, I'm sorry, but it just is the truth. Um, and that's why we're here to tell you it as it is, um, not to sugarcoat it. And you need to make the money. You need to try and get the mini pupillages. You've heard other panelists say how important they are, and I completely support that. Um, it shows that you're putting yourself about. It shows that you're a grafter. It shows us that you've got desire. You're prepared to make sacrifices. And all of those qualities are essential for the barrister. And you've heard these guys say, I think they're nuts, but they say they're working till 5 a.m. or 5 a.m. and p.m. and they're working in the middle on Sundays. It's a day of rest. Um, you make these choices, but you at the stage you are, um, viewers, you know, you've got to try, I think, and realize that you, it's not about just that you did a mini pupillage, it's about you showed that you had the will. The, the commitment to go and make the money to make that train journey to find that place in London um, where you can uh, you know, rent a house, whatever, rent a flat, a hotel, however you did it. I know what I did. I, I got my mini pupillages. They were very important to me. Um, and I bugged friends and mates. I slept on floors. Um, it didn't matter. I got my five days. Um, and that was very, very important when I was you know, studying and coming to the bar to have that on my CV. Um, by all means, it can't be possible for everyone. Then be honest in your application letter. Um, I don't think it'll come up in an interview, but even in the interview, do the same. Always be truthful, always be straight and explain that you were just unable for the reasons that uh, were your circumstances to afford to put together the money for a mini pupillage. But you all want to know what's the best option. The best option is you know, get that money, invest, invest, invest in yourself because that's what you're doing. Um, these aren't sums of money that are uh, gifts. They're very important strategic sums of money you are spending on the foundations upon which you are building your future career. Can I just carry on that? Yeah, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I know that I'm conscious of time, but um, I entirely agree with Lawrence and what he's saying in that um, it is an investment in your time. Um, from what I'm aware, uh, from what I know, sorry, there are a few chambers who do um, funded mini pupillages. I don't know specifically which ones, but I've definitely heard about it and you can, um, you know, you can research that. There are also schemes through some of the inns where they give funding 
to those who are unable to afford mini pupillages. Again, I think Inner Temple does it. Um, I, I'm, I'm advertising them because I am an Inner Temple barrister, but I think there are other inns that do it as well. Um, so you can certainly look into that. Um, the other reason why you, you should be looking into doing these is because they're honestly the only way of seeing what, what a barrister does day to day. Um, we can tell you what we do, we can romanticise about it, we can tell you, you the, the less enjoyable parts, but you will never fully understand until you see it yourself um, and you actually say, you know, this is a flavour of what I, what it's like, do I, do I really want to do this? I remember doing a mini at one chambers where I had one person telling me they'd slept on the floor of chambers for a week, um, going through boxes, uh, about 20 boxes in the room on a case. And at that point I thought, Jesus, do I really want to do this? But you only really get that once you do it. Um, the other thing is, if you don't get a mini, go to court and watch. You can watch in the public gallery, go to the Royal Courts of Justice, find a case that interests you. There's a public listing available online, uh, which is renewed daily, and go and watch a case so that at least you can then put something on your CV to say, actually, I did a court visit. Here's the case I watched. This is what I found interesting about it. So there are, there are ways around it. I Great. just wanted to second what Turan said about going to watch. That is the best experience that you will get as far as the advocacy and breadth of cases is concerned. Go and sit in the Magistrates Court, go and sit in the Crown Court, go to the RCJ, sit and watch. Um, and if you want to see quick turnover and lots of different styles of advocacy, then the Magistrates is the best place to see it because you will see volume lists and you will see everything in that list from custody cases, bail applications, sentences, trials, um, case management hearings, and you'll see the complete spectrum of client in a day. You will see the vulnerable youth who is in foster care, who has no idea what's going on. You'll see the guy who's been withdrawing from heroin for he's been in the police cell, and he's tired and emotional, shall we say. Um, you will see the complete spectrum of cases, and I can't commend that experience enough to all of you. We have a few questions from uh, mature students. Is age a barrier to getting to the bar? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can think back to when I did the BBC um, and I did it straight out of my degree. So just into my twenties. However, I remember very, very fondly a chap doing the BBC when he was 50 and he was just starting completely different career direction. Um, it, it, I know of pupils who you would, um, I guess, categorise as mature. Um, no, I don't see it as a bar at all. Sometimes it can actually be an advantage, um, depending on the area you want to go into. I have a very vivid memory of um, chatting to an opponent in court in a personal injury case. Um, she used to be a dentist and she decided at the age of about 50 something that she wanted a change of direction. And she now specialises in healthcare work and does a lot of regulatory work in the General Dental Council. Um, so for that kind of thing, it can actually help you to have a whole career behind you, um, you know, if you're interested in a particular area. Phil, the next question's for you. How did you become a coroner and at what stage of your career did you take up the role? Um, tell us your I've age now, by the way. For, <laughs> <laughs> I've been a coroner for uh, about five or six years um, and I'm 48 now. Um, so in the early 40s, you can apply after being qualified for five years uh, or seven years rather. I think it's 10 to be a recorder, um, but generally speaking, you might need to have a bit more wool on your back generally and a bit more experience, but there are younger and younger people being appointed and that's the trend these days. Uh, and uh, I, I fell into it really. Um, you've probably done research um, and there's a lot more judicial positions and regulatory positions that are available than when I started off at the bar. And one of the areas that's uh, a real growth market at the moment is coroner's inquests. Um, because of the jurisprudence and because of the um, changes in the law, the chief coroner's guidance, some of you may be familiar with, there's a lot more people being appointed as assistant coroners and area coroners now than there ever were. 
and a need for that. Uh, I completely fell into it about um, inquest work about 12 years ago or so, uh, when a firm from, uh, a national firm from London, um, were, were getting upset at the invoices they were getting from a number of London chambers. Uh, and so they came north looking for better value and interviewed on the Northern Circuit about a dozen barristers and gave work to three. Uh, and I went into the interview in my former chambers to uh, really appease my clerk, telling him that I'd never done an inquest. I spoke with um, the three people from this national firm and said, I've never done an inquest. And they said, tell me about your practice. And we had 10 minutes. And uh, six weeks later, I got a brief, which was an eight week inquest in Stockport um, Coroner's Court. Um, and I turned up, I had read it from cover to cover. I had read Jervis on inquest. I was utterly terrified because I was in a court uh, as a reasonably experienced barrister doing his very first inquest with a great and good in the inquest world. And the person who was presenting on behalf of the coroner uh, is now a Sir Leslie Thomas QC. Um, so there were all sorts of really impressive people that I was able to learn from and I learned as I went along and it was a really interesting inquest and a very in interesting experience for me, if a little terrifying. And, and I got a number of briefs and then I um, thought, well, you know, I'd really like to actually do this. Um, now I've got a bit of experience behind me. And the one thing I've always done is to check the law, read the cases, keep up to date, uh, and, and really make myself um, marketable. Um, and I made two applications and was lucky enough to get one in Leeds. Uh, and I also sit now in Lancashire. So um, I find it extremely rewarding. But there are people now, just as a final point, getting appointed in their late 20s and early 30s um, to part-time positions, district judges, positions on regulatory bodies, like the Dental Council, um, the, 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 the um, medical tribunals uh, and the like. Um, so there are real opportunities out there once you get into chambers and once you establish yourself to get into um, part-time judicial work and then full-time judicial work, you really want that. I, I'm not sure whether I really want it full-time, if I'm perfectly honest. I, I would miss being a barrister, I miss the self-employed status to do and however you want it to work for you it can do at the bar um, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity I am conscious that we've slightly gone over are you guys free to stay for 15 more minutes or does anybody need to go I can stay that's fine I've, I've got about five and then I'm afraid I'm gonna have to I run what did you say sorry Phil I can stay okay I can stay. yeah great um I'll just have a quick so there's a question aimed at what sort of things can people be doing during covid to enhance their chances do you want to take that one carl before you go um sure um so i i was on another panel a couple of weeks ago um and this question came up and i i didn't answer it this way so i'm going to shamelessly steal the answer because i thought it was i thought it was a great idea um, and it also goes for when COVID isn't here, or at least when the restrictions have been lifted. And again, I appreciate not everybody is going to be able to do this because of the financial implications. But firms, chambers, groups, NGOs, everyone who is involved in any area of law is always looking for more people to help them. A lot of the time, they can't afford to pay the people that they need to help them. If you have the time and if you can do it, offer your services. Even if it just comes down to reading papers and summarizing documents for people, people will bite your arm off. Um, and if everyone is stuck at home, because so much more is digital now, it's so much easier to do. Um, and I had um, a girl help me. Um, earlier this year on a matter, I needed a massive jurisprudence going through for an ICC case and summaries on various different points. And she sat there for three weeks in the comfort of her own home and summarized for me. 
Um, it was an absolutely massive, massive help. And people are always looking for that help. And don't underestimate the power of a week or two weeks work experience on your CV, particularly if it's in an area of law that you're interested in, because again, that's what's going to sell you. That's what's going to make you a little bit different to the people who have just gone degree professional qualifications, apply for pupillage or apply for positions. It's a little bit different. This one, it shows your commitment. It shows your drive. It shows your enthusiasm and it makes us want to know more. You know, why did you apply to that firm? Um, obviously you can say, cause a very friendly barrister told me that it was a good idea to do so. Um, but it will, give you something to discuss and it will also expose you to an area of law and you know you'll be able to make a decision as to whether you actually you know you could have in your mind that you want to go into a specific area but once you get exposed to it you may think actually i hate this you know something can be romanticized that you think you'll like it when in reality that you don't so that would be my piece of advice if you can afford to do it i appreciate it, not everybody can but if you can afford to do it write letters to people Tell them your experience, tell them that your position that you are at, and do you need anything doing? Can I help you in any way? You would be surprised the amount of firms and groups who would love that help. That's great. I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much as well, Carl, if you do have to zip off. I'm no, sure no, that it's fine. been great for everybody to hear your story as well. My absolute pleasure. Always happy to help. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening and my fellow barristers thank you very much for um allowing me to witter on thank you very much thanks carl lawrence what advice would you give to those who are hoping to get to the commercial bar do you have to be um educated at oxbridge to succeed um the latter point first is no uh but phil has said some um home truths today and it's good that people are able to hear that which is uh, there is a preference um, clients prefer people going to uh, Oxbridge or Redbrick um, you can't get away from that it's a buyer's market of course it is uh, so we've got to be honest that the commercial bar is heavily favored towards people who have been at Oxbridge I didn't do that um, I'm there but it means you might have to work a little bit harder with your clients um, and in your cases, but once you build your track record, then the academia falls away. Um, what's the solution to that? And how do you get to the commercial bar? Become commercial yourself. Think not of yourself. Your investment is the service to your client. Follow where and respect where money flows. It's the client who's paying for a job to be done or seeking a solution. And not all work involves putting a wig on and going to court. You could be structuring something, for example. Um, the client wants a problem solved at the end of the day and they're prepared to pay for it. Now, the more you're on the same level as them, the more you're going to be attractive and the more employable you are. And likewise, the more you're going to be taken on. And it's the same for the other areas too, in my experience. Um, so whilst you're studying law, study um, common sense and study commerce itself. Understand, I've been in, I've had interviews where I've asked people what the Dow Jones is or what the FTSE is, and they don't know. And yet they want to be commercial lawyers. People don't know what a hedge fund is. In fact, some people don't even know what the periodic table is. I've asked that in an interview. Um, you need to be an all rounder with knowledge because that's what your clients are looking for. Look, they take it for granted. You can do law, you're a barrister. But what they want to do is feel empathy that you actually understand how their businesses operate. And that's a key aspect of, of commercial work because it comes across when you have a conference or a conversation, it comes across that you understand business itself. Um, because as I said, it's a given that you know the law. And the other aspect of it is, is do the detail. Uh, the devil's in the detail. You've got to find the devil in, in the problems and, and resolve that. And again, those skills can be learned now while you're learning your law. They aren't on the law syllabus. They are not on the BPTC syllabus. I'm sorry and saddened to say that. So you have to graft, you have to get down to the library, uh, get some books out, or go to Waterstones, go online. 
but I'd suggest actually buying the books yourself um, so that you in your own time can read how the business and global economies work, how banking sectors work, how companies file accounts, what are, what's a COP9 for example. These are the sort of things that the business sector expect and if you have these additional qualities uh, coming to the bar, it will show in your cover letter and it will show in your interview. And therefore, if you have these skills, it negates the advantage that someone from coming from Oxbridge may have who hasn't taken that path, who hasn't done that extra graft. So everybody at the end of the day is welcome. It all come down. The more you put in, the more you'll get out. Great. And I think that just to finish, um, maybe we could all go around and sort of answer the question. What's your one best piece of advice for, for succeeding in pupillage interviews? Syed, did you want to start? Be yourself, be truthful. Um, let the personality come out because you can't get away by trying to blag your way through an interview. So read your application, understand it. Um, what have you put down on there? Why have you put it? Um, if you say you've gained experience in something, make sure you can demonstrate that experience. Um, it's the evidence, you're the evidence, and you need to provide it. Phil, did you want to go? Oh, Turin's off. <laughs> oh, okay, that was a very opportunistic. Okay, um, I, I entirely agree um, that you should be yourself. Um, it, it's very obvious when you try not to be yourself, I think, and it comes across quite badly because actually it's something you should be using as a tool. The reality is, um, and I'll say this because we are giving you harsh realities, there will be people out there who judge you for your accent or judge you for your background or who, you know, who think that, that you're less likely to succeed. Um, I remember a barrister once telling me to pronounce my G's and I was like, really, is that what matters to you? Um, yeah, exactly. I've got some frowns on the call now. Um, you know, it, it was irrelevant. I wouldn't care if I was looking at somebody and speaking to them. But for some people, um, you know, it matters. But don't don't cover it up because um, it's not the way it should be. The profession is changing. It, it matters far less now than it ever did before. Um, and I think that you should focus instead on the things that matter. Um, the one piece that, of advice that I would give is to structure your answers. Um, the most frequent feedback I got where I was unsuccessful in an interview and asked afterwards um, was, oh, your answers were very well structured and that is important to us. So even if you're talking utter rubbish, split it into points. Well, wh why do you think you'll make a good barrister? Well, I've got three reasons. Here they are, and um, they might not be exceptional reasons, but at least they're very clearly set out and you are able to understand them. Um, make sure you structure every answer, take a breath before you begin, um, give yourself the time to think of those three points and then just deliver them as clearly and persuasively as you can. Lawrence, so do you want to go? I feel like Phil's holding off. <laughs> um, Again, um, this is the reality couple of hours. Uh, it is incredibly true that hum you, whoever's interviewing you, they're just human. We're all the same. Um, and first impressions count. Those first three to five seconds as you walk in the door. Um, so it comes down to this. You've got to dress the part. I'm sorry, but you just have to. Um, and I learned this when I was interviewed. Well, I remember I, I couldn't afford proper clothes and I, I went for an interview and I had a, a woman's blazer and my jumbo black cords. Um, and it didn't matter to me, but I, I felt it wasn't right. It wasn't proper. And what I did is I applied to um, a government grant at that time that existed, which gave me a hundred quid uh, voucher. Um, and I went off to pop shop, yes I did, and I got myself a three-piece suit and some shoes and a tie, 
and I look the part. So I'm, I'm not giving this um, uh, uh, advice to you other than from the heart um, and as someone who's interviewed for 18 years now. Um, you'll be amazed. Sometimes people just come in and they look, just don't look the part. And why is that important at the end of the day? Well, it shows that you can be bothered, that you are keen to make a good first impression. And that's relevant again when it comes down to clients. You know, they're going to be paying for a service. They want their barrister to look the part. Now, I know certain people can get away with it and, and great if they can. But the general truism is that there's an expectation as to how you would be looking in an interview. There's an expectation when clients see you for the first time. And a lot of that is how you present yourself for that initial you know, meeting, those first few seconds to make that good impression before you get a chance to make better impressions when you answer questions. If in doubt, play it safe. White shirt, black blazer. Don't wear a flowery shirt. <laughs> And last but not least, Phil? Be yourself. I, I remember receiving criticism from a Chambers in London um, that I was too staid. And you may have appreciated something of my personality on this uh, <laughs> meeting so far. You've got to be yourself. You've got to express yourself. Uh, but, but at the same time, concentrate on your presentation as well. So it's, it's a difficult balancing act. Go and get some experience of interviewing. I know I needed to get some when I was doing it, and uh, particularly going as, as I do now or have done recently, gone for judicial uh, appointments. If, I went to see a, a, an outside company, which I'm not really a fan of, but I was able to sit down. It was just little things about your posture, the way you are, the way you present yourself, your hand movements, tone of voice, the way in which uh, you present your answers and structure your answers, there are people who are very, very adept at uh, looking at you as an individual uh, and saying you're doing this, that and the other wrong. It's a bit like when you first do your first bail application on video on, on the bar course and you're absolutely awful and you're moving your arms and you're doing all the things that you shouldn't be doing. Just because you have progressed doesn't mean to say you are doing the right things now. And it might just be a couple of pointers from people may even be your friends practicing with it. That's what I would do and that's what I had to do because I know I got some criticism and I very took it, took it very much to heart and thought, okay, somebody said that about me, perhaps they've got a point, perhaps I need to change the way in which I present myself. So that's what I did, but be yourself. Great, I'm going to leave all the questions there. I feel like if I've not asked the question out loud, one of you have either um, responded in the chat to the question as well. So I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I just want to say on behalf of the over 80 people that entered the session, thank you so much for giving up your evening to help everybody and to provide some insight. I know that it's been valuable for me, so I'm sure it's been valuable for everybody else as well. Thank you very Thank much. You. No problem. You can feel free to leave at any time. <laughs> and good luck, everyone. Good luck in your applications. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to the panel. I've really enjoyed myself. And I've even learned that if you slide the thing across here, you can see other people, not just the four people. Wow. Hey. I know I thought you've become an expert now, Lauren. I have. I've been, I've been <laughs> tinkering around thinking, oh, it does this, uh, but always afraid that at some point I want to cause the whole thing to crash <laughs> while I tinker, you know, but luckily I got away with it. But thank you very much. I appreciate the time for everyone and thanks to the 80 people who joined us. Hope it was helpful. Take care and good night. Thank you, everyone.